I have been coming to Presque Isle my whole life. I grew up here, so as a kid, I was brought here to do hiking and swimming and biking and fishing. And then when Sean and I got married, I brought him here and this kind of became our little place to go. We started bringing Beckham here and he loves it. We have so much fun. It's just something for us to kind of get away out of the city and um, do together as a family. I love getting out on the water with my family because it's just a chance to enjoy nature and be in nature together. Getting into the lagoons, you usually see things like herons, turtles, beaver, all different kinds of plants and animals. It's really beautiful. Just the serenity, the calmness. You get away from your regular life, get out and immerse in nature and really have that experience, which I want for Becca. This is a chance for him to really experience the beauty of nature and the wildlife that's all around us. Northwestern Pennsylvania is truly a gem, cherished for its natural beauty and ecological importance by the millions of people who live and recreate here. Nestled along the southern shore of Lake Erie in the Great Lakes region, the rolling hills of Northwest Pennsylvania are interwoven with abundant wetlands, lakes, and streams that are home to a rich biodiversity of species some of which can't be found anywhere else in the Commonwealth. While these waterways support a wide variety of life, they also bring joy to life through the recreational opportunities they provide and give people a way to connect to and gain an appreciation for the region's unique and precious waters. However, while enjoying these resources, people can unknowingly and unintentionally threaten the places they love through the introduction or spread of invasive species. An invasive species is an organism that is introduced to an area outside its native range and causes, or has the potential to cause, harm to the environment, economy, or human health. Without the presence of natural controls that would otherwise keep them in check, non-native species can spread rapidly, compete directly with native species for space and resources, and significantly alter habitats. Invasive plants, animals, invertebrates, and pathogens can also adversely impact recreation and livelihoods by clogging waterways, introducing diseases, and fouling shorelines. Aquatic invasive species can be introduced and spread through a number of human vectors, traveling in the ballast tanks of ships, through the release of an unwanted pet or plant, dumping of bait buckets, and by hitching a ride on clothing, pets, trailers, watercraft, and gear. More than 180 non-native species have invaded the Great Lakes region many of which are wreaking havoc on the waters of Northwest Pennsylvania. And the watch list for new potential invaders grows each year. The economic cost of dealing with aquatic invasives is massive. About $25 million a year is spent in the Great Lakes region to control the sea lamprey alone, a parasitic fish that, if left unchecked, could bring an end to the more than $7 billion fishery that supports 75,000 jobs and is enjoyed by 5 million anglers a year. With so many aquatic invasives already established and others knocking at the door, can we still protect the places and species that make Northwestern Pennsylvania unique? What can the average person do to make a difference? And what's at stake if we don't try? I've been studying birds um, since 
1981 or something like that when I first got interested as an undergraduate. So it's been about 40 years that I've been involved with birds uh, in various ways. My husband and I really came together through birds, uh, but as in a professional way. He was a postdoc and I was a grad student when we met. But we really enjoy being out hiking and we always go birding wherever we travel. And we just enjoy getting out, walking, looking, seeing, listening. I really feel alert and alive. Cat birds. Tuned into nature and what's going on around me. <laughs> and drawn out of myself and my own self-absorbed reflections. Lake Pleasant is sort of a time capsule, I guess, of how things were, <laughs> well, it could be again, perhaps. It's intricate, complicated, and it's just packed full of life, every cubic inch of it. We don't have that many places like this left because they've all kind of gotten steamrolled by invasives. And so it's neat to be in a place that has, that is so intact. It has all this species that are rare and now, and they're still here. So it's really cool to be able to visit a place, see it, and sort of soak it in. So it is like a page from the past. It is a little time capsule of a full set of species that uh, really nowhere else in the area has that full set still present. At the end of the last ice age, more than 13,000 years ago, five enormous depressions scoured by the retreating glaciers filled with meltwater to create the mighty Great Lakes. Smaller in scale, but just as precious, eight lakes were left behind in what would become northwestern Pennsylvania. As the area was settled, these ecologically and geologically unique lakes were altered and impacted as they became ringed with homes, resorts, businesses, and farms but one lake remains much closer to its original state, Lake Pleasant, located just eight miles south of Erie, Pennsylvania. The Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and its partners have worked tirelessly since 1990 to rejuvenate, conserve, and manage much of the land around the lake, protecting water quality and preserving Lake Pleasant as the region's most pristine, glacial lake. Part of that restoration effort includes invasive species prevention and management. The Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's ban of motorized watercraft and the use of fish as bait have helped to reduce the chance of an accidental introduction. But a few invasives have still found their way in. The non-native narrow-leaf cattail has taken root in precious marsh habitat and even hybridized with the native cattail. If left unchecked, these invasives could spread, wiping out the diverse array of rare aquatic plant life in the marsh, including its nine species of concern. But the Conservancy and a trusted team of treatment experts are not about to let that happen. We are here treating uh, invasive plants on the south side of Lake Pleasant, particularly narrow-leaf cattail and hybrid cattail. And there's many different ways to treat invasive plants, but the method we're using today is called hand wiping. Be careful while you're working because there's spots that are solid, and then there's spots a step away that you can nearly fill up your waders. Um, so we'll all be working really close together. It's a very selective method uh, using herbicide that's applied with a wick glove right onto the plant. And the reason we chose that method is because this is a very high quality habitat out here. There's a number of rare native plants, plant species that you may not see anywhere else in your life. And using a method like hand wiping is important in that situation to avoid collateral damage and impacts to the native plant population that 
can happen, less selective methods are used. So to apply the chemical, you would dip your hand um, into the herbicide to absorb some into your wicking glove that's on top of your chemical proof glove. Um, you really only need a small amount on your glove. Your goal is to coat as much of the leaf surface as possible with the herbicide by wiping your glove up the plant, um, transferring the herbicide that way. Uh, it's really selective way to apply. You can imagine if you were to try to use any kind of sprayer to do this same application, most of the native plants in this area would die as a result of the collateral damage from the overspray or the drift. Doing it this way is really beneficial to keeping this plant community intact uh, while we try to get rid of these cattails. Out here, one of the important goals is to make sure that this glacial lake habitat here stays intact. And one of the threats to this area is the potential for the narrow leaf and the hybrid cattail to basically create a monoculture out here where this habitat is lost. Uh, the native plants can't compete as well with something like these invasive species. There's a potential out here that if these plants aren't managed, then this area we're looking at could turn into just the solid cattail marsh. And the uh, fish species and the bird species out here really aren't able to utilize that habitat the same way they are uh, as you see it now. To treat a normal acre of invasive plant populations can use anywhere from 10 to 20 gallons of solution. Uh, and out here with this method where you're directly applying with a glove right onto the plant, we're usually down near a gallon per acre. So there's a lot less chemical needed when you're as targeted as you are with hand wiping. We should start to see results from this application in two to three weeks. It'll start to die back and turn yellow. It's basically just inhibiting the photosynthesis. Our goal in these treatments has been to keep this open wetland system uh, open. This last year we started the treatment in this portion of the lake and the cattail has already been reduced significantly and we're hoping that continuing the treatments here will make that goal happen. The site is a uh, difficult site to work on. There's obviously we're out here in canoes to access it in the first place um, and it's very tough terrain to walk around in. We've got a mixture of tussocks and beaver sloughs and all sorts of obstacles to work through but uh, sometimes the hardest to reach areas are the most unique and have a lot of value to them and are worth working through. Treatment of invasive species in sensitive areas does require the utmost care. And today we saw some of the most painstaking treatment that you will see uh, going be from plant to plant and individually wiping it with herbicide. That method is time consuming, it's expensive, but it's what needs to be done to do this right. And we have tools like IMAP invasives and we also have drone technology that we can use now to fly over and monitor for these invasive plants. So using those tools can help us more carefully target where our treatments need to occur so we can be the best stewards not only of the land but also of the money to help manage these invasives. No invasives treatment is ever really 100%. There's always going to be this follow-up monitoring, going back, doing follow-up treatments. So it's critical to use all of the tools we have in our tool belt to, to make sure that we make the most of, of the efforts that, that we put forth to control. Surrounding Lake Pleasant itself, within our conservation area and beyond are several gravel ponds. Since this lake was formed by a glacier, 
know, it moved gravel, so this area is rich in gravel deposits. So over the years, gravel was mined from, from the area. It created these gravel ponds, which do have some invasives present in and around them. So that can include Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, and Phragmites. So we do ask that if there are folks that are fishing in the gravel ponds uh, or any other water waterway for that matter, before you come into Lake Pleasant to thoroughly clean all of your gear. So if you're using a boat, clean the boat, boots, clean your boots uh, and, and anything else. It's critical to stop the spread. It's the best method we have. And although we're particularly concerned here with Lake Pleasant, that should be done anytime you're fishing or moving between water bodies. It is important for recreational users of this lake and others to be aware of some of the invasives that are out there and what they look like and be able to identify them. So you don't need to be a botanist to know what the most problematic invasives are. So there are resources like IMAP invasives. You can report things that you see through IMAP invasives, for example, uh, using their mapping tool. And that helps uh, folks like us identify, you know, where spe certain species are located and come up with a plan to, to manage those. Just because you're paddling along the shoreline and see lots of vegetation does not mean that it's all good. There can be a small pocket of invasives and then the next year you come out, it's a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And eventually it can take over and wipe out an entire area and you have a monoculture there, which means you have all the same kind of plant growing. Uh, and that can really be detrimental to all of the life in the lake because they depend on the diversity of species to be there. Maintaining biodiversity is one of the greatest ways that we can be prepared to manage our land for the future. In the face of climate change and invasive introductions, maintaining biodiversity is, is one of the greatest ways to be ready for the future. If biodiversity is the best strategy for an ecosystem to compete against ecological threats, then French Creek is playing with a stacked roster and looking to win. One of the most biologically diverse and species-rich streams in the northeastern United States, the French Creek watershed is home to more than 80 species of fish and 27 species of freshwater mussels, several of which are threatened or endangered making the watershed vital to the conservation of these species. But an aggressive player from Team Invasive, who has dominated in the Great Lakes, has French Creek fans worried it could be a complete game changer for the system. The Round Gobi, a ballast water invader from Eurasia, who has become the most abundant bottom-dwelling fish in the Great Lakes, was discovered in Waterford's Lake LaBeouf in 2013 marking its first leap out of Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed. The consensus is that gobies arrive in Lake LaBeouf through a bait bucket transfer and from there use the lake's outlet to enter the main stem of French Creek. French Creek flows into the Allegheny River and then into the Ohio River. So we're sort of like the uppermost part of the Mississippi watershed. So the introduction was pretty significant and it did cause a lot of communication among partners, agencies, universities in the French Creek watershed because we were very concerned about what the impacts might be. In other places where they have been introduced, they have decimated some of the native fish, pushed them out of their ranges, they have dye overlap, they may be eating the eggs of other native species, they're aggressive, they reproduce really quickly, and so they're really good at what they do. They're really good at being an invasive species. Since the introduction, Dr. Casey Bradshaw Wilson has been studying the round gobies movement through the watershed and its impact to key species like darters and freshwater mussels. Through early detection and monitoring, the team from Allegheny College, including students and Dr. Mark Kirk, are working to paint a complete picture of the invasion so state and local agencies can use that knowledge to inform management decisions throughout the region and beyond, or maybe one day develop a successful control method. 
So today we were backpack electrofishing to do a general survey to see abundance of fish that we were getting, diversity of fish we were getting, and then also whether or not round gobies were present in this area. Um, so it's a pretty standard method using electricity in the water and the fish float up to the surface if they have a swim bladder or kind of sink to the bottom if they don't have a swim bladder. They're collected with nets and then we can ID everything, count everything, and then we release the species back where we found them. Okay, lift up. I think you at least got something. Did you get yeah. a crayfish? No, I got started. There you go. So far, it's pretty much what Mark and I would expect to find in this stretch of stream. Lots of diversity of darters. We've caught some minnows. Spotted darters are one of my favorites. They're only found in the upper Allegheny. It's the only place in the world that they're found. Um, so we're lucky to have them here. And again, the males will get bright red spots on them and get a really vibrant blue chest on them for both kind of the spotted and the blue breast starters. They're really pretty. Oh, a little tippy. Tippy canoe. This one here is um, a type of catfish. They're called mad toms. And then this darter over here is the smallest darter. Um, it's called a tippy canoe. You can see they're kind of orangish in color. This is about as big as they get. They stay really small. Um, and again, you find them in the main stem of French Creek near the riffle areas. Not as restricted as the spotted, but uh, it is unique to this, yeah, to this general region. Uh, so right now around gobies, we know that they're eating juvenile mussels. Um, we know that they do feed on the eggs of game species and non-game species. We also know that they do fight aggressively for particular habitats for breeding and for certain sections of stream that could displace native species as well, particularly those small benthic species that, that they're sort of cohabitating with all the time. One of the things that people forget is how intricately everything is connected when you're working and living and recreating in an ecosystem. You can only pull so many pieces out of the ecosystem before things start to fall apart. And so keeping our native species here and having them play the roles that they're meant to play in the ecosystem is really critical to keeping the entire food web and ecosystem in check. For native mussels to complete their life cycle, they have to have a host fish. And many of these mussels are species specific. So if round gobies are displacing host species to mussels, and if round gobies are predating on mussels, um, pretty soon you have a web that's being disrupted from the bottom up. There's also been places and, and studies have shown that when round gobies are highly concentrated in an area, they disrupt the aquatic insects and invertebrates living in that system. So again, you can see these bottom-up trophic cascades where the whole system could fall apart by disrupting all the little pieces at the bottom. This one right here. Well, and we normally do, yeah. Right now, Gobi's range is expanding, but it's slower than other introductions have been, and there's not as much of a density of round gobies while they're spreading. Probably because French Creek has so much biodiversity, the, the stream itself is pushing back to this invasive. So there are species that will eat round goby. There is competition for space within the stream. There's a lot of native species that can kind of keep round gobies at bay. Whereas in Lake Erie, there wasn't as much diversity. In the tributaries, there's certainly not as much diversity. So round gobies have really taken a stronghold in that system versus French Creek where you have all these natives kind of pushing back on them. Lake Leboeuf is full of round gobies and they have spread downstream. Right now, they're just moving downstream. They haven't tried to swim upstream or into any tributaries. So they're right now moving through the path of least resistance. They also utilize larval drift. The young will come up out of the substrate and then just use the water to flow downstream. That's really what they're doing at this point. My biggest fear is that they'll be introduced to the other lakes in the watershed and then we would have all of these lakes pumping round gobies out um, and that's where we we'll really start seeing like huge impacts on the watershed as a whole.
In order to prevent new invasions, the first and foremost is to know what a round goby is and what it looks like, so to be able to identify it. Also knowing how aquatic invasives are spread and just being careful and cautious about your gear, your boats, your waders, your fishing poles, your bait, knowing what your bait is if you're fishing. At the end of the day, rather than dumping bait back into the water where you're fishing, dispose of it in the trash, get rid of it into waste containers, kill the fish in some way where they're not being introduced into the area that you're fishing. So it's just really being responsible for yourself and your equipment to make sure you're not introducing any invasives into new places. I got into fishing through my parents. My dad was a trout fisherman. My grandparents were Lake Erie pier fishermen and, and then ice fishing. So I've been fishing since I was about three years old. So I'd make about 55 years of fishing. And I've been fishing French Creek pretty much for about 40 some years. French Creek, it's just the diversity. It's the habitat, it's the scenery, it's the eagles, it's the osprey, it's the hellbenders, it's the otters. It's, it's just a beautiful thing. It's still a very rural uh, stream and you, you feel like you're out in the middle of nowhere. I spin fish, which is basically with a spin rod, and I fly fish with a fly rod, and uh, both of those use artificials. I don't like to use a lot of live bait or anything like that because I'm worried about like introducing something that shouldn't be in this creek, in this watershed, or in any watershed uh, from that bait bucket. You know, whether it's a crayfish or it's uh, some kind of minnow or some kind of water flea or insect or something like a goby. I, I just don't want to do that. That's why I kind of stay away from um, bait fishing and stick more to the spin fishing and the fly fishing using artificial lures. There's definitely a shared responsibility. Anglers are, are part of this community. French Creek is a large part of this community. And to keep it as pristine as it is, every angler should be taking every precaution that they should or can to keep it as pristine as it is. Let's keep it that way. Let's keep what's supposed to be here, here, and what is alien out of this area. I think everybody has a part to play in that. You know, whether it's you teaching your kids to be a proper steward, or you just being a proper steward yourself, definitely uh, French Creek is worth it. I mean, it, it is a treasure. Where Pennsylvania's land meets the waters of the Great Lakes, another treasure can be found. It isn't marked with an X on any maps, but is instead drawn as a narrow spit of land spilling out from the coast and into the cool waters of Lake Erie before curving back in toward the city of Erie to create Prescow Bay. Prescow State Park supports six distinct habitats that nurture many threatened and endangered plant and fish species and is a haven for over 300 species of nesting and migratory birds. Prized for its intrinsic beauty, wildlife, and recreational opportunities, Presque Isle hosts more than four million visitors a year, not including a number of unwelcome travelers who have taken up permanent residence and have proven extremely disruptive to life at the park. I don't like to use militaristic terms, but Presque Isle to me is an example of the front lines and the conflict between some of the rarest and most vulnerable native species and some of the most problematic invasive species. So this is an area where we're trying to preserve the best of Pennsylvania and we have some of the most problematic that we've seen in North America. I think the reason that so many invasive species are found here in and around Presque Isle State Park is because it's heavily utilized by the public. We have, on a good year, more visitors than Yellowstone National Park, believe it or not. 
and they bring their boats and they bring their fishing gear and sometimes they transport that equipment from one water body to another and inevitably some of the living organisms that are part of the equipment that people bring in do end up being discharged into Presque Isle. Presque Isle Bay is also an important shipping port on the Great Lakes and we do have commercial uh, freighters and they can discharge through their ballast water movement a number of problematic invasive species. That's actually a very important mechanism or vector by which invasive species were introduced into the Great Lakes in the first place. So I think that combination of commercial traffic, public traffic, and also the fact that we have just ideal habitat for a lot of these species is almost the perfect storm that allows expansions uh, and new invasions to occur. Throughout his career surveying fish in Presque Isle and the Lake Erie watershed, Dr. Jim Grazio has not only studied these expansions and introductions of problematic invaders, but has been the first to document several of them. Most recently, in 2012, he co-discovered an invader in the Presque Isle Lagoon system that gives even this seasoned veteran cause to worry. Starry stonewort. I'm a fish guy, that's my expertise. Plants usually don't excite me. Starry stonewort excites me and not in a good way. This is one that I'm most concerned about. A likely ballast water arrival from Eurasia, starry stonewort has the ability to biologically and physically reshape entire waterways. Grazio and colleague Pete Schuster are heading out to survey the lagoons to see if starry stonewort has further spread, threatening to overtake the delicate ecosystem and beloved water trail for kayakers and anglers. Of the 70 or so rare, threatened, or endangered plant species that occur here on the peninsula, most of those occur in the wetlands, and some of them are unique to the lagoon system. It was actually a series of inland ponds that were dredged and interconnected back in the early 1900s to serve as what was supposed to be the world's largest freshwater fish nursery. And that's one of the reasons we have such amazing biological diversity and fish reproduction in and around Presque Isle Bay. Pete, are you seeing anything that looks like stonewort at this point or can't you tell? Oh boy, I think we're there. So if I can direct your attention off the starboard side or the port side, you can see it looks like the same type of a plant, right? You notice that? And the rule of thumb, the rule of thumb is that whenever you see just one species of plant, it tends to be an invasive. I thought we'd have to boat all the way up Long Pond, but sadly, the epicenter for the starry stonewort was at the head of Long Pond. It's a, at a, by a little bridge area. Um, it seems like a lot of invasive species occur at this bridge area where the public has access. Um, and we've seen that starry stonewort spread down throughout Long Pond, which is part of the lagoon system all the way down the channels, and I'm surprised that I think we see it already, you know, at this location in the park. It's a macro alga, it's a large mass of single cells that grow together and act like a very invasive plant. This looks like uh, a lot of our higher plants, but actually each, uh, each one of these filaments is just a single cell. And one of the ways you can tell whether or not it's a macro alga stonewort in particular, uh, or you know, a look-alike plant is if you, uh, if you squeeze, if you compress the, the plant material, it'll, uh, it tends to pop. This is a single, it's a, just a single cell that's just, that's just collapsing. One of the distinctive things about starry stonewort, um, as opposed to the native stoneworts, is the presence of this uh, reproductive structure called a bulbul and it looks like a little white star, but these are just asexual reproductive structures. The interesting thing is they're not needed. A fragment of starry stonewort, this is reproductively viable. It can reproduce via what we call fragmentation. So one of the reasons that it spreads so quickly and why it's so invasive is because you just need a little piece of it to start a new colony. A lot of invasive plants, they, they tend to monopolize the available habitat. One of the unique things about starry stonewort is not only does it cover the bottom of the lake bed two-dimensionally, 
but it grows to such a volume that it actually occupies the entire three-dimensional water column. So not only are you losing the bottom habitat, but you're also effectively losing a lot of the habitat that's available higher in the water column as well, often to the exclusion of really any other native plant species. It's quite amazing. So it looks like the water depth here is, what would you guess, a foot or two? So there's the, there's the top of the starry stonework right about here. Fully, you would think we're in water that's you no, know, maybe you know, a few feet deep. It could be 10 feet deep, and the rest of it is starry stone wood. That's my concern. So it's like a giant Brillo pad, a giant Brillo pad, a big sponge. That's gonna that's gonna help trap sediment as it moves, as it flows slowly with the water through this interconnected lagoon system that was created as a fish nursery on Prescott Isle State Park. It's gonna trap sediment. It's gonna absorb nutrients as the stonework dies, it's gonna release nutrients, and it's gonna promote, it's gonna accelerate that closing of this system, that transition from water to land, which is the opposite of what Presque Isle State Park wants to see happen. Presque Isle State Park needs to spend a lot of money periodically to dredge out the system, to knock back the invasive plant growth, to keep these waterways open so that we can enjoy them as Pennsylvanians and we can still benefit from their, their function as, a, as an important nursery habitat for fishes and other aquatic organisms. Presque Isle State Park spends $84,000 a year on treating invasive species, but the investment is worth every penny. According to a report on the economic impact of Pennsylvania State Parks, Presque Isle visitors spent $76.9 million in 2010, with the total contribution to the local economy resulting in over 1,000 jobs and $25.3 million in labor income. When it comes to the prevention of invasive species, it's easy to get stuck in a catch-22 scenario. Dollars spent on successfully preventing establishment of a new invasive may seem like money wasted to some, if the ecological destruction and impacts to recreation never come to pass. However, if those dollars aren't spent and a new invader becomes established, the costs become exponentially higher to manage that invasion, inevitably begging the question, why didn't we prevent this? This makes the allocation of funding for education, monitoring, and early detection of non-native species critical, albeit a tough sell for scientists and policymakers in order to save the region's natural heritage and economic integrity. Each subsequent biological invasion tends to destabilize the ecosystem a little bit more in a way that makes it more likely that another problematic invasive species will arrive. How many of those facilitated invasions can an ecosystem withstand uh, until really you have a, a drastic and abrupt collapse? The only thing that we can do is try to prevent new invasions, new introductions of invasive species, whether it be accidental, intentional, or as, as a result of, uh, of ignorance. Once a new species arrives, becomes established, and begins reproducing, there's very little, in most cases, that can be done to remove that species from the ecosystem. So the bottom line is, which one of our native species, which part of our biological heritage as Pennsylvanians, would you be willing to sacrifice to make room for that new non-native species? for me to kind of teach Beckham just responsible environmental stewardship because we've got generations to think about moving forward and we want to make sure that these types of beautiful habitats that are biologically diverse and unique um, are still here for generations to come. First thing you got to do is clean, right? So clean, that means use your eyes, look for things like plants that are stuck and take it. Prevention steps are simple, they're easy, 
Um, they really don't take much time at all and they can make all the difference. Prevention really is our greatest line of defense against invasive species. And so if you can just take that extra few minutes to clean, drain, dry off your equipment, make sure that you're cognizant and not moving stuff, um, that can make all the difference. So we really put a lot of emphasis on prevention and making sure that we're, we're doing our part there. So then you know bacteria and other animals get into different places. That's good. No invasive species, huh? Thinking about, you know, the question of what kind of Pennsylvania are we going to leave behind for future generations and just knowing how even one invasive species that ends up in a location where it's not supposed to be can cause such a change to the environment, to the ecosystem, to the species that are around it. We can enjoy nature, we can recreate in nature, but we're also protecting nature at the same time and do what we can to try to preserve the beauty that we have here in Pennsylvania.